for the founding queen, sharing her nest with all these rivals seems like madness. But the economics of desert survival is a numbers game. And for the moment at least, this communal life is the key to her future. Each queen now lays her first batch of tiny eggs, each no bigger than a pinhead. Many new nests contain two or three queens, limiting the initial brood to less than 100 eggs. But these 10 queens have produced well over 300 eggs. And when they hatch, the colony will become an instant superpower. For the founding queen, this is the main advantage to taking in lodgers. If the eggs are not kept clean and coated with antibiotic saliva, they would quickly be smothered by fungi and rot away. The eggs soon hatch. Fed by the queens, the voracious larvae grow quickly and then pupate. A few weeks after the eggs were laid, the first tiny pale workers emerge from these silky cocoons. All ant workers are female and sterile. Unable to reproduce themselves, their sole purpose in life is to serve the queens. They darken as their bodies become harder, and then they are ready to take up their duties. Some stay underground, tending to the queens and to the remaining brood. Others head for the surface for a first look at their strange new world. The entire army is mobilizing. The raiding parties head out to the last place they'd found food, where they had pinned down the few winged termites. The bearing they've taken is leading them straight towards the termite mound itself. Ants and termites have been adversaries for over a hundred million years. Now their armies of today are on a collision course. But without any physical contact, the blind army is as unaware of the termites ahead as the termites are of the approaching ants. They begin to swarm over the outside of the termite towers that for the moment appear to them to be just mounds of dried mud. Guards are posted while others explore every crevice for any sign of food. First contact. The ants know there's something here and change direction towards the alarm signal. They mass around, the guards alert for any unpleasant surprises. This is unknown territory. Anything could be lying in wait down there. A worker gingerly explores the gaping hole, and a scouting party lays a scent trail for others to follow. Activity increases. An assault is on.
Other ants have found the termites foraging tunnels and scramble inside. The tunnels are narrow and not at all like the open spaces driver ants prefer. Termite soldiers with enormous jaws and heads prepare to check the incursion. A soldier termite confronts the invaders with a threat display, but it's not going to impress a driver ant. The ants penetrate deep into the nest, and the residents intensify their warning. First blood is to the termites. But the tunnel guards are in danger of being overrun. The ants break through the first line of defense. Lash the leaves together, gangs of workers pull as one. Bridges are built, helping ants move quickly around the site. To hold their construction together, they rely on the youngest members of the colony, grubs. When they're in their final stages of development, they produce strands of silk and make the perfect glue gun. In just a few hours, their new home is complete. Their nest happens to be on a mango farm. But it's no ordinary orchard. Mr. Boonchu has recruited this army of miniature warriors to defend his fruit. They'll eat any pests. And by tying these strings between mango trees, Mr. Boonchu helps the ants get to new foraging grounds, expanding their empire and protecting his orchard. Healthy ant colonies mean fewer pesticides. And the weaver ants give the farmer something else. Mr. Boonchu likes to harvest their eggs. from each nest, separating the ants so they can return to their colony. These eggs are a Thai delicacy and a favorite dish of the North.
by working with wildlife, farmers in northern Thailand are able to benefit from nature's bounty and help it flourish. This must be the easiest place in the world to get lost. I'm in the great sea of sand in the eastern Sahara. Behind me, to the south, wave upon wave of dunes stretch for hundreds of miles. It would be hard to imagine a landscape with fewer features to it. And with temperatures rising to 50 degrees centigrade during the day, getting lost here could be lethal. And yet, this is the home of one of the most remarkable animal travelers. An ant that regularly leaves its home in these sands and sets out on the longest overland journey made by any insect. It's called cataglyphis, and it comes out during the middle of the day when other insects die from heat exhaustion. Cataglyphis searches for these casualties when it's so hot that even it seeks relief from the burning surface when it can. At first, it forages randomly over the sand. But when it finds its exhausted prey, astonishingly, it returns in a dead straight line to its nest. It's so hot in the desert that even Cataglyphis has to get back as quickly as possible to its nest if it's not to risk death. These foraging journeys are equivalent in human terms to a trek of 40 miles over completely featureless territory. And yet the ants, even if they wander about in searching for their food, are able to return directly to their nest. How do they achieve that? Well, have a closer look at one leaving on one of these journeys. It keeps stopping and making a turn. Stop and turn. Stop and turn. As it turns, it looks up at the sun, checking its position. It moves on again and checks the sun and the pattern of polarized light. It can measure the distance between stops and it always takes a bearing on the sun at every one of them. When it eventually finds food, a quick calculation, and it knows exactly the shortest way home. If you can use a beacon that's with you wherever you go, like the sun, then, of course, you're no longer restricted to your familiar home ground. You can venture into unknown territory. You can go long distances to find new feeding grounds. Great journeys are now possible. It's day two, and the mass evacuation is underway. The ants march along well-worn tracks, originally the foraging trails between the old nest and the swarm front, but now the main roads along which queen and colony will pass. Their trek is about the length of two football pitches laid end to end. And they're not traveling empty handed. Each ant carries a larva or a pupa hung below her body. The equivalent of us running a marathon while carrying a sack of potatoes and not stopping for a rest. The entire emigration can take up to three days. It seems chaotic, but every ant in this extraordinary melee knows exactly what she's doing. Giant soldiers with their massive jaws line the route, so the workers with their precious cargo can travel safely along a living avenue. They're passing at a rate of 250,000 ants an hour. Some unwittingly carry infiltrators, 
Even tiny ants are host to even tinier mites. The invading army is building in numbers. Travelling with her subjects is the queen. At two inches long, she's the largest ant in the world. And she's a new queen. When her mother's colony grew too large and divided, half the workers switched their allegiance and now accompany her on her first emigration. Her enormous bulk has been coaxed along the trail and now she takes her place at the heart of the nest. The queen is in her palace and what a palace it's become. It's a living bivouac. A nest made entirely of ants. All its internal walls are made of ants. All its corridors and chambers constructed of living bricks. And when they're all assembled in their new stronghold, they form one of the largest concentrations of ants on Earth. Protected by these living walls are the nurseries where wave after wave of brood carriers deliver their load. 